Cave diver Stefan Panis and his team had a very limited time window to dive and map a flooded decommissioned slate mine in Belgium. But this isn't just a normal cave diving story. This includes a mine worker who went blind, a jealous diver and a badger attempting to sabotage the project, slate blocks just falling onto the divers from the ceiling, underwater 3D scanners and some cool history about this site. So the slate mine itself is named La Mora Pira and is located in Rue de Babinet in Bertrix in the southern Belgian province dating back to 1836. At its height 70 miners were extracting ardoisier uh, as the slate is called from three separate levels but due to competing mines in the area who could mine slate at a lower cost the mine eventually closed and as they were leaving they switched off the water pumps and the mine slowly filled up with groundwater creating a cave divers playground but access was strictly prohibited. In 1996, Yves Krull bought the mine and started the in the heart of the slate heritage business. He had to pump non-stop for five months just to get the water level down to 25 meters. And today it costs around 1000 euros every single month to maintain that water level so that the water doesn't reclaim the mine. The dry sections were then converted into a tourist attraction, telling stories and educating the public about the mine and the slate industry. Blocks of slate averaging 100 kilograms were carved out, that's about 220 pounds if you don't speak metric, and miners would carry these on their backs to the waiting mine carts, often up wooden ladders and convoluted tunnel systems. When one was full it would then be hauled out of the shaft by a winch operator up at the top to be turned into to roof tiles in the workshops above ground. The workers themselves were proud and stubborn. There's a story of one man who carved out an enormous 300 kilogram block and instead of breaking it up and then making multiple journeys he just exerted himself to the extent that veins in his eyes actually burst blinding him in the process but he still managed to carry the block out on a single journey. The museum was running as normal in recent years, but then, as with so many other businesses, the museum had to close due to COVID-19. But instead of learning how to bake bread at home or adult colouring books, Eves decided to move forwards with some new projects in the mine that they had been thinking about, and the new quiet period would allow the space and time to allow them to properly map the underwater sections of the mine and inspect the chambers. And that's where Stefan Panis's La Mora Pier diving project began in a once-in-the-lifetime opportunity to dive and map the flooded sections of this mine. Stefan had been working on a documentary project with the nearby communities of Bertrix and Herbumont, so one of the town mayors introduced him to Eves, who was in the market for some tier one cave divers. They were given the green light to dive and document the mine, though they were granted only a short time window in which to do so. This would be a one-off opportunity to dive the site and explore as much as possible in a very short time window, and he was only too grateful to take it with his mine exploration team. They arranged to start as soon as possible because time was of the essence. In return for being allowed to dive in the mine, they would have to produce a 3D topographic model of the site and present Eves with any photos and video footage for use in the museum, which was to be rebuilt over the next year or so. Now, up until this point, nobody has been allowed to dive in this flooded mine, so it's very much as they left it in the 70s, just full of water now. The team enter the water down the main shaft where a long time ago the mine carts were pulled in and out. When the museum opened, Eves had installed a cart to take the visitors up and down into the mine on the same rails and this is where the team came across their first snag. One winter a badger had crawled into the fuse box and caused a short circuit and fried the electronic system for the lift. That was the end of the lift system because the insurance company had refused to pay. Apparently the insurance policy didn't cover badger damage. So the team would have to carry their gear down and then back up again after the dives. But luckily for the team, when Eves bought the mine, he actually worked day and night for a week to install 268 stainless steel steps leading down, allowing him to reopen the museum to the public. 
the steps go all the way down to the water level and the shaft is wide enough for storing plenty of stage tanks and cameras which was just a luxury for the dive team who aren't used to having this much space let alone an actual metal staircase. Only five meters down on the first dive the team are already facing side passages to the left and to the right. On the right they spot a beautiful old hand pump before the passage splits into north and south corridors. The mapping project is gonna take some time. At the end of the left hand corridor stands a massive timber winch, beautifully preserved in the chilly groundwaters for decades in just this huge chamber which is named the Italian Room. Louis Suque, an 80-year-old miner they would meet afterwards, told them that it had been mainly Italian immigrants who worked in this part of the mine, hence the Italian room. Diving deeper, the team dived down a 45 degree slope to take in the impressive sight of a minecart still actually on the rails. At the end of the room, the shaft narrows and then continues down until it levels out at a depth of around 37 meters. Here, it turns underneath the main shaft that they've already passed through to connect with a chamber from the right-hand corridor at around five meters. Falling sediment and zero visibility here leads the team to nickname this shaft the Hellhole. In the left corridor, at around 10 meters, they discover many objects, including an old telephone for communicating with the surface. From the plans, they know that the first massive chamber can't be too far away, but unfortunately the narrow passage is blocked and it would cost them far too much time to be able to clear the debris and continue. So the team move further along the main corridor, which is a bit more open and free. And the lead diver is confronted with a face suddenly out of the dark gloom. It turns out to be a decorative figure from the museum that has fallen down through a ventilation shaft uh, into the water and wasn't a forgotten worker or a lost tourist it was just a, a mannequin just one of those nice things that you expect to find in a pitch black cave underwater as your torch beam passes over it a vaguely human face just ahead a minecart turntable leads the divers onto the next extrication chamber which is a huge open space for the divers to float through. Miners would plan certain sections to lay explosives in and then blow them at the end of the day after they left so that they come back in the morning and the dust will have settled and they could get straight back to work. At the next turn they find steps upwards that surprisingly lead them to the surface. Uh, it's a perfect mid-mine emergency exit for the miners and now the divers should anything go wrong. At this point the divers start to use their Seacraft sponsored scooters to cover distances faster and with less effort but they're eventually faced with a collapsed section that appears to have sealed the last chamber forever so they have to draw a line at that. The 10 meter shaft to the right hand side holds another nice surprise. It seems to be full of debris and because this was the old part of the mine they assumed it was used to just stuff anything that the miners didn't really need to take back up instead of just finding space for it they, they just shooed it away in there. Following the double rails on the ground and just beyond the turn is another collapse but because the divers are diving on side mounts they're actually able to squeeze through this restriction at this point. A corridor leads to a new room, the top of which emerges into an air pocket, but no connection to upper dry levels. It's just a trapped air pocket from air from the 70s. The 60 meter level of the mine proves much harder to negotiate. The old miner Louis told them that the old right hand side of the mine was very unstable and that he had never been in there even when the mine was active because it was just deemed too dangerous at that time and whilst one of the diver was tying off one of the main lines so that they could safely find their way back with Stefan hanging in the corridor to let him lead the way a slate block falls from the ceiling onto his legs so they decide to go the other way. Again, the new route is blocked, this time by a spider's web of electrical cables mid-water that would just be too dangerous to try and get through in zero visibility, so they decide to come back later with proper tools, and in the meantime, they of course turn back and continue on another level to explore even further. On the following dive, they bring tools to clear the way here and discover some extrication chambers, but the time window to explore the mine is now closing and proves a little bit too short to actually explore the entire mine system. 
On the first dives, a lot of line had been installed to make navigation easier and safer on subsequent dives, which all takes time. And with all of the convoluted tunnels, they would have to record a lot of the information in the water to be able to map it accurately. The main lines are marked at five meter intervals where they would stop take measurements and bearings and then draw a sketch of where they are as well as a still photograph at each point for reference. On the following dive, one of the team actually films everything. This approach takes a bit more time but they know that if it's done correctly the results are just going to be amazing. On the final dives, the team have a very helpful little tool called the NEMO. Connected to the line, it registers the depth, the distance, angle, and bearing. And after the dive, the data can all be uploaded into a computer and then transferred into an Excel spreadsheet or actually shown as graphics to more accurately map the passages and the rooms underwater. After the dives, they're allowed to document the dry parts of the mine above the water level, both touristic and non-public areas in a similar way, and marvel at the massive and spectacular chambers that are now dry. It's amazing just how many tools are still left in place, from drills and hoses and hoists, as well as personal equipment such as gloves and coats, or an empty cigarette packet. Drinking cans, bottles of beers, all sorts of stuff that miners would traditionally take down into the mine. During the exploration, a jealous diver actually caught wind of the project and posted false information on social media that anybody could just dive there simply by calling up the museum, presumably hoping that inundated with phone calls, Eves would call a halt to their project. Fortunately, both he and the mayor were able to pinpoint the actual person who was falsely reporting this, and he was reported to the authorities, which he stopped. Um, why people try and sabotage other people's projects like this, we'll, we'll never know, but don't, it's, it's not a good move. On completing the Morapir mine quest, Stefan was lucky enough to find something quite unique, a 32 minute long documentary made in 1953 whilst the mine was still active, with footage both from above and below, and he plans to use some of this footage in a documentary about the mine that he's all pulling together. When the museum is fully reopened after rebuilding, a lot of their work is going to be used in the visitor briefings, including photos and video footage, as well as the 3D topographical model that they built, which will be used as a new safety plan for the tourist parts of the mine, including escape routes, as well as the obvious points of interest. He's already produced more than 200 hours of drawing work and the result promises to be spectacular. The mine is actually open or parts of it are open again for nine euros and 50 cents. Anyone who wishes to do so can tour the dry areas. Uh, diving of course is no longer possible. That was it. They're the only divers who are ever allowed to go in there. Uh, so don't bother asking Eves, he would just say no, uh, you just have to make do with the, uh, with the images taken by Stefan and his team. If you want to learn more about Stefan and his work, you can head over to stephpanisphotography.com. Uh, you can find him on Instagram under stephpanisphotography and the mine exploration team as well to keep up with them and what they do. Take a moment to like and subscribe to the Scuba Diver Magazine channel and consider becoming a channel member and check out our social media channels as well. Thank you for watching everybody and of course, safe diving.